joy to see you here today to be with you. Students, I pray you've had a wonderful weekend in your uh, retreat. Uh, I don't need to bring up the week. Everybody understands on some level. But I'm going to ask you to do something with me for the next uh, 45 minutes till our service is over. Can you, as best you can, set the election aside? It'll be there when we go home. And, and, and let's turn our attention to the Word of God. And, and, and when I get started in this sermon, I know what your tendency is going to be. This isn't helping me today. My prayer for you is that the Spirit of God will cause you to understand how important this message is about living as a Christian in this world. So let's, let's ask God to give us understanding and cause us to see the truth of His Word. So would you stand please as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 beginning with verse 16. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. What am I saying with this boastful confidence? I say not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For if you bear it, if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face... To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I have... At the hands of the Jews, the 40, flat, 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak that I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in a wall and escaped his hands. Lord, help us now to make sense of what Paul's doing here. What is he saying? Why does this matter? What does it matter to me? What does it matter to us as your church? What does it matter today in the 21st century in a world that's unhinged? Lord, show us. and May we embrace your way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Social media has changed so much of how we live. And here's what I realized. There's some of you in the room, that's all you know. It hasn't changed anything. It's just the way you've lived. See, social media has created the opportunity for another me. There's the real me, and then there's the social media me. Now, I can take one of two pathways with the social media me. I can come off as one of those people that had it all together. I can get dressed up in my best clothes for the photo shoot. I can practice the script for every video that I'm going to make. I can pour over every word that I'm going to use in my captions to put the best forward me I can. Or I can take another option. You know those people. They're the train wreck you. That all their social media life is how their life is a train wreck and how horrible of a person they are and they put themselves out there in a very negative light. So listen carefully. 
Paul is neither putting forward the perfect version of himself, nor is he putting forward the horrible version of himself. Paul is choosing another way, a countercultural way, a kingdom of God way. And here's the main idea that servants of Christ embrace weakness and difficulty for the glory of God. Throughout 1 and 2 Corinthians, Paul's dealing with these, quote, super apostles. These people have infiltrated the church in Corinth and told the, the church what winners they are, how perfect they are, how awesome they are, and what a loser Paul is. So you come now to a culmination of Paul been dealing with this tension with these super apostles, and he brings this discussion, his whole argument to a climax, and here's what he says, basically. I'm going to play their game. It's a foolish game, but I'm going to play their game, and I'm going to use personal examples about myself. But what I'm going to reveal is very different than what they do. I'm going to reveal two things about myself and about servants in Christ in general. First, what they reject, and second, what they embrace. First, servants of Christ reject arrogance and mistreatment. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little, what I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. So he's saying, I'm going to use the social construct that these super apostles are used, have used. I, I'm not using a construct in how the Lord himself has used. I'm going to use it, but he's going to take it and turn it on its head. Verse 18, since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm going to verbally talk about myself. And then he says, verse 19, for you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. Folks, that is a sarcastic statement. He's saying, you think you're wise? Here's what you're actually doing. You're bearing with fools. That's how wise you really are. So Paul decides what he's going to do is fight fire with fire. He's not going to use arrogance. He's not going to talk about himself arrogantly. He's going to point out the arrogance of these super apostles. He's not going to use the human standards that they use. He's going to use another means. And he's also going to reject mistreatment of others. So arrogance and mistreatment of others go together. When you take the superior high road, then you can run over people to get there. Because why do they exist? They exist to support my high road to support who I am. None of this is going on in the world we live in at all. He says to these Christians, you bear it. In other words, you put up with it. You embrace it. And here's some of the things you're embracing from these arrogant people who are mistreating you. If someone makes slaves of you. Now, I don't think Paul means literally that they have become enslaved to these people where they have to work in their household or business or whatever. He means they've reduced you to a form of slavery. That whatever they tell you to do, you do it. You put up with this form of slavery. You put up with someone who devours you. This is a strong word. It means ravenous eating. And when I was a little kid, I went out to feed my grandfather's bird dog and I took a piece of the dog food and held it out and as I remember it in my five-year-old self that dog put my whole arm in its mouth <laughs> I'm still filled with fear today that's because that dog was a ravenous eater he's just saying these people just consume you they take advantage of you they use you and here, here here's the irony of this whole thing Paul's saying you know it you know you're being used, but you so want to be associated with these people that you let them use you. Sounds like middle school. By the way, there's still a lot of adults living in middle school, but anyway, I'll move on. You put on airs. You make yourself to be something you're not. Everybody knows you're a fake. 
but you put on airs. And then he says, or strikes you in the face. Now, again, does Paul mean this literally, that they slap you in the face? I don't think so. I think he means this metaphorically. You've got to go back in time into this culture. And I, 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 I grew up in a similar... Western North Carolina is a shame-honor culture still. That's, that's the world you live in. If you slap somebody, it, 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 slapping was not to beat somebody up. You slap somebody to humiliate them. So here's what Paul's saying. They humiliate you so much so they slap you in the face. Let's go back to how this sentence started. You bear it. You embrace it. Now Paul goes through this explanation of how they mistreat people, and then he says in verse 21, again, a sarcastic sentence. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. Paul says, I reject that kind of mistreatment of people. That's not what a servant of Christ does. That's not what a, how a servant of Christ treats people. One author said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul told the Corinthians that he came among them in weakness and fear and much trembling. There's a sense in which he admitted and professed himself to be weak. He had no self-confidence. He did not believe in his own ability to persuade or convert people, but he felt the responsibility of what God had called him to do. And he relied on the Lord for both knowledge and success completely through the power of the Spirit. His conceited and arrogant oppressors were strong in their own estimation. They condemned they condemned the mean-spirited apostle and considered him destitute of all sources of power. But the weakness which Paul here speaks is that which he now attributes to his enemy. You called me weak? You know what's weak? That you mistreat people. That's weakness. Now, Paul is about to take up his boast. He's about to talk very directly about himself. But he's going to do it in a very different way. It's in keeping with how chapter 10 ended, verse 17. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, it doesn't sound like that's what Paul's doing because he talks about himself in the personal pronoun. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. So here's what Paul's doing, and you've got to pay close attention. He's showing you how the Lord has commended him in his weakness. So servants of Christ embrace weakness and difficulty for the glory of God. Rest of verse 21. Whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. So Paul's saying, I'm going to take their literary device, their speaking rhetorical device, and I'm going to turn it on its head, and I'm going to boast of my folly, my weakness, my disappointment, and my defeat. I'm not going to talk about my wins. Now, he sounds just like them when he starts. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. So these super apostles claim to be of great Jewish pedigree. Hebrews had to do with your ethnicity. Israelite has to do with your religious and social life. A descendant of Abraham is to say, theologically, you're a part of God's chosen people, his offspring, the people of covenant prominence. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, Paul says something very similar. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to law, a Pharisee. Now I want to pause right there and ask a question. When you study the Gospels, does Jesus present the Pharisees as humble servants of God? No. They are an arrogant, abusive people. So when Paul says in Philippians, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, here's what Paul's saying. I was an arrogant man. I was proud of myself. I was proud of what I've accomplished and what I've done. Now, verse 23. He asks a question. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. Paul says, I can't believe I just said that. 
I'm a better one. Now, he does not proceed to inform us of how many came to Christ under his ministry, how many churches he planted, how many sermons he preached. He doesn't discuss the rapid growth of his his missionary efforts. Instead, Paul focuses on the difficulty and hardship of taking up the cross and following Jesus. He's a servant of Christ. These people brought letters of recommendation. What Paul brought to every city was according to Galatians 6, 17, his body. And his body bore the marks of Jesus. When you looked at Paul, you saw someone who identified with the suffering Savior, the one who died in our place for our sin, who gave his life for us on the cross at Calvary, who was buried, died, rose again on the third day to set us free, who says to everyone who would follow him, take up your cross, and follow me. So what Paul's now going to describe is what it means to take up the cross, what it means to be a servant of Christ. And he talks about the sources of the marks that he bears. With far greater labors. (laughs) This is free. You need to know people go into ministry because it's easy. Now listen to me. There's an easy way to do it. Just play golf and show up and preach every once in a while and visit at the hospital and keep people happy. and It is easy. But if you embrace gospel ministry, there's great labor. Paul says far more imprisonments. You don't even know if these super apostles have ever been in prison. Paul's been in imprisonments. More imprisonments. He's been beaten so many times now, he doesn't remember how many. Countless and often near death. So this is what it cost him to serve Christ. Imprisonment means you're awaiting either execution or your sentence. These beatings are for preaching. Near death, and here's, one, here's an example. Five different times he received the 39 lashes, or 40 lashes less than one from the Jews. So the Jews, five different times, have beat him, beat him near, nearly to death. Three different times, the Gentiles or the Romans have beat him with rods. And then he says, just quickly, once I was stoned. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 14. I I just want us to slow down and think about this for a minute. Just quickly in your mind, anybody want to remember why you would be stoned in the Old Testament? What did you do to deserve stoning? Anybody know? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Here's the answer. So they didn't on a whim decide they were going to stone Paul. These Jews from Antioch and Iconium, verse 19, persuade the crowd and they stone Paul. So they persuade the crowd that Paul is blaspheming by preaching the gospel. So they stone him and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now folks, that doesn't mean when they were dragging him out, Paul was moaning and groaning and kicking They were dragging out a corpse, a lifeless corpse. As far as they were concerned, the man was dead. And when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. (laughs) He didn't catch an Uber to the next town. He went back in. And on the next day, he went with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, the very people who beat him to death. Strengthening the souls of disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So why did Paul go back? Because they were distressed. Here they've embraced the gospel and the very guy that brought the gospel to them, young people think about it like this. This would be like this weekend, the police showing up at fall retreat and beating Matt to death. What would you do then? So Paul returns to strengthen these disciples and to remind them of this. 
Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Here's what Paul's saying. That's just normal. This is just the way it is. This man had incredible physical stamina beyond his lack of fear. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day. I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from den child, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea. And by the way, dangers in the city, wilderness, and sea covers the whole earth at that point. Hey, so let me help you out. The world's going to open back up. We're going to start going again. Let me just tell you a question around here. I know it's a question that's in your head, but it's not going far. Well, Pastor, is it safe to go on this trip? You know what the answer is? Everybody ready for the answer? Is everyone ready? No. There's the answer. Safety is an illusion. It's an illusion. The only safe place is heaven. That's it. See, that's really what we're down to. We're trying to create heaven on earth. And by the way, we're missing a whole year of our life trying to do it. Brothers and sisters, here's a real question I have. Would Paul have continued in COVID? I'll just let you ponder that. As I continue, danger from false apostles... In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. He didn't have the basic needs of life. He didn't have anywhere to sleep, so he stayed up. He didn't have clothes to wear, so he froze to death. He starved. It wasn't because he was fasting. He didn't have enough food to eat. And then on top of that, there's people. Oh, the people. Verse 28. And apart from these other things... There is the daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all churches. And Corinth was a part of that. Corinth was part of its stress, part of his anxiety. This daily pressure, day after day, hearing reports of what was going on in the churches. He sums up part of it. Who is weak and I'm not weak. Paul, Paul moved toward the struggling disciples, just like he did at, at at the, at the disciples where he returned at Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, he, he moved toward those who were struggling, who were, who were wanting to give up, who were weak, to try to strengthen them through the power of the Spirit. And then he says, who is made to fall? Made to fall. This is, this is someone tripping up a young believer. He says, and I am not indignant. Oh, oh, well, she meant well, Paul. She didn't mean to hurt her. No, that kind of stuff, when people taught false doctrine and led the sheep astray it infuriated paul and it should have here's what's here's what's so hilarious to me right now we we have become tolerant over things we ought to be intolerant of and we have become intolerant over things we ought to be tolerant of we are so upside down we don't we don't even know what to do anymore we don't even know what to care about and what to speak about and then we look at this man, Paul, just doing things completely different because he's a servant of Christ. And if you look at the ministry and life of Jesus, which we're about to, we're about to go in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be reminded that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. Turn with me to Acts 20. Paul's about to leave the Ephesian believers. He's been there three years. Paul says in verse 27, he didn't shrink from declaring them the whole counsel of God. Then he tells them to be careful, to pay attention. He's speaking to the leaders of the church because false wolves are going to come in. They're even going to raise up from among them. Verse 36. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all, and they embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he said spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Here's what they knew, brothers and sisters. Listen carefully. 
They knew this man had been shipwrecked before, and they knew that could be his coffin he was about to get in. This could be it. But they knew, ultimately, this is the last time they would see him. See, by this point in time, the fury against Paul had so built that he knew, he knew that his end was sure. He could have hunkered down in Ephesus, had a great pastoral ministry going there. Could have stayed. They loved him. They didn't want him to go, but Paul was a missionary. Paul was the apostle. And here's what he wants to do. We know when we read Romans, he wanted to go to Spain. He wanted to go to the end of the world. And he knew what it meant to get there. So he left. So here's my question to us, to me, to you, to our own heart, and I pray to yours. Am I embracing weakness and difficulty as a servant of Christ for the glory of God? Let me just ask a few questions here. Are you looking for an easy ministry? <laughs> I could, I'm trying not to get sarcastic here, okay? So pray for me. I've prayed for my own heart. I'm struggling with you. Look, look, look brothers and sisters. There's not an easy ministry in the life of the church. Everybody get ready for the next sentence. Ministry is not convenient. It's not. You looking for an easy church with easy people? Here's why some of you hop churches. You ready? Get ready for it. About to tell you, because you love honeymoons. So you go to this new church, and the preacher's the greatest, and the music's the greatest, and the people are the greatest, and these are the best Christians I've ever been around. And after about three years, all of a sudden, these ugly Christians show up, and you go, Where'd they come from? So I'm going to go to another church, and I'm going to have a honeymoon with that group. Listen, churches are made up of people. Hello. And I are one of them. And so are you. Part of being a part of the life of the church is embracing and dealing with the weakness and difficulty that it means to do life and ministry together. It's messy. It's difficult. As we keep the Word at the center and Christ at the center, then we press on through embracing that weakness and difficulty. And we say with Paul, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. I'm going, to, I'm going to boast of the things that reveal my humanity, who reveal my need for Christ, my need to serve Him. And then Paul says, verse 31, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. So what he's about to say, he knows I'm not lying. At Damascus, the governor under Ar Ar Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a wind and a wall and escaped his hands. You go, man, that was anticlimactic. Golly, pastor. Man, you got all this stuff. This dude's getting beaten, whacked, and all this stuff. And now we come to a basket. What does this have to do with anything? Paul, what do you mean? Now track with me here. Paul says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Here's what Paul's saying. I'm reading between the lines. Let me tell you the first time I realized it. Let me bring you back to the moment God drove this truth home to my heart. Arrogant Pharisee on the road to Damascus. You know why he was on the road to Damascus? He was going to rid the city of Christians. That was his mission. Power! Get rid of these people. And on the road, the powerful king of kings intervened in Paul's life and opened his eyes to the gospel of Jesus Christ and powerfully and gloriously Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. He enters the city eventually a new man and a changed man and immediately he goes to the synagogue and preaches the gospel remember what it's like to be a new christian You're on fire you think everybody's gonna believe this everybody's gonna embrace it I'm a Pharisee, I'm Paul, I'm going to show up at the synagogue, I'm going to preach Sunday, and all these Jewish people background believe they're going to become Christians. Nope, they turned on him. 
And Paul says, you want to know what weakness is? Weakness is when they put you in a stinking fish basket, shove you out the window, and let you down on a rope. I was on my way in power, and I left in utter humiliation. But here's what I learned on that basket ride down the wall of Damascus. And here's why I pressed on. That in the midst of my weakness, that's when God does His work. This is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, moreover, it is required of stewards that they may be found faithful. This is how Paul started in 1 Corinthians. We're servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So, brothers and sisters, (laughs) the social media me will be judged by public opinion. And if I get the right people to help me and use a little bit of exaggeration and some other worldly means, I can change what you think about me. But there's a day coming when I'm going to stand before the king. And the king is going to require that I, as his servant, and as a steward of the mystery of God, that I be found faithful. And the way that faithfulness is going to be revealed is through weakness. Weakness. This is how the kingdom works. It's upside down. It's completely different. So I'm with you, brothers and sisters. This has been an awful week. It's a shared American week. It's been an awful week. But without me telling you the 50 other things that went on in my life, let me just say, it's been an awful week. And here's what this man learned. in a fish basket in another way. That's how God works. I don't stand up here every Sunday on my wins, man. Wins. Here's the wins. No. We stand in weakness. And it's through a weak church that God is going to work in this nation not a powerful one. Let's pray. Lord, may we embrace may we embrace weakness and difficulty. And Lord, I confess right now as I as I offer this prayer that we would I recognize that those who reject weakness and difficulty could very well reject Christ. We confess that this has been normative Christianity, and it is normative Christianity in most of the world. And Lord, I I don't claim to know everything that's coming. But on this side of Christendom, may we recognize that you have called us to be your servants and to embrace your way in the world. So make us stewards. Make us stewards that will lead us to discover that your strength is perfected in weakness and that by the power of God. So encourage my brothers and sisters who have gathered. And for those who have come who don't know you as Lord and Savior and are deeply struggling with the words I've shared Would you open their eyes to the weak, conquering Savior who is Jesus Christ, our Lord? Now, Lord, I pray that we'd find some firmness under our feet and that we would share with one another as we sing of this great truth 
that you are the cornerstone. We pray this in Christ's name.